message is entitled, O Come, Let Us Adore Him. Our scripture reading is, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive the glory, honor, and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are, and were created. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for this privilege this morning that you have blessed us with in worship. Thank you for this opportunity to praise you, to magnify the greatness of your Son, to see him uh, sitting upon the throne of heaven. Thank you for Christ and what he has brought into our lives. Thank you for loving us and saving us and giving us this privilege to magnify you this day. I give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Invite your attention to the uh, fourth chapter of the book of Revelation. And what I'd like for you to do right now is read verses 1 through 11 uh, to yourself. And when you get done, just look up and make eyes with me and we'll know when to continue. Revelation chapter number 4, reading verses 1 through 11, please. If you haven't finished yet, don't worry about it because we're going to be uh, covering each one of these verses uh, expositorily uh, throughout this message. Um, if you read these verses, you can see that we're going to go deep uh, with our uh, Savior uh, this morning. Revelation is a very pictorial uh, book. It's full of uh, symbolism and types and metaphors uh, that uh, were privileged uh, to view God uh, through these uh, wondrous illustrations. And uh, there's a passage in Psalms that uh, says, the deep calleth out onto the deep. And this is what Christ is doing in our lives. He's calling us uh, out into the depth that is his. Uh, and we here don't believe in shallow Christianity. Uh, we believe in deep water uh, Christianity. And what a privilege is ours to see the king on the throne this morning. Last week, we had the privilege to look into heaven through uh, John's eyes. And immediately our eyes were drawn to the throne and the one sitting upon it. We've learned from past lessons to look for key words and key verses when we are uh, studying uh, the scriptures. Uh, and there is a key phrase in chapter number four that rivets our attention if you uh, read it in some depth 
because the word throne is used 11 times or 14 times in 11 verses. So you can see that the focus of chapter number four is on the throne and the one who sits upon it. In fact, the word throne is used another 46 times throughout the entire book of Revelation. No matter what happens in and on the, his creation, God remains ever in control. And I rejoice in that. Thrones in the scripture obviously were where, were where kings rule and reign. And the one sitting upon the throne is our king. And then we learn that he alone is worthy of our worship. And this morning our attention is going to be drawn to those things that John sees around the throne. And it is here we will begin in some earnest. In verse number two with me. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And we know who this is, it's Jesus. And in verse number three, our Lord comes clearly into view and we're giving a glorious glimpse of the one who is our King. And upon seats, John describes, there are multiple thrones that we're going to be looking at just momentarily. I lost my place in the outline, but it happens. I invite your attention to verse number three. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper in sardine stone. We're given a wondrous snapshot of Almighty God on his throne. And it is glory and absolute sovereignty that we will be seeing. There's no possible way for words to adequately describe the glory of God to us. All John can do is make a comparison between the brilliance of gems in an attempt to describe the radiance of the one who's upon the throne. Clear jasper as a mineral can be found ranging in color from vivid orange to sunshine yellow, all the way through bands of hues from seafoam green to different shades of vibrant purples. And I have a jasper stone uh, in my office with all those colors in it, by the way. Sardine is a deep, pure, fiery gemstone that is ruby and blood red in color. The psalmist describes our Lord as being clothed in light, clothed in glory, in Psalms 104, verse number 2. And both the sardine stones and jasper are also found in the breastplate of the high priest in the book of Exodus, Exodus 28, verses 17 through 21. And back in verse number 3, we see the magnificent spectrum of the rainbow that is surrounding the throne. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like an emerald. Here we were reminded of the covenant of the rainbow that God made with Noah to never flood the earth again in Genesis 9. God's covenant with Noah also applies to his entire creation as well. Usually a rainbow appears after the storm. But here, this heavenly rainbow comes before the coming storm of judgment that is about to fall upon God's creation. The divine sentence is about to be declared upon a sin-cursed creation. But remember in all of this, there is still mercy being offered from Christ. In fact, in the book of Habakkuk, he cries out to God in this prayer saying, in wrath, remember mercy. 
And God, indeed, is the personification of mercy and forgiveness. Of course, in Jesus, forgive them for they know not what they do. In verse number four, we see round about the throne were four and twenty seats. These seats in the Greek are actually thrones. So these thrones that are surrounding the king's throne are there because they too are ruling and reigning with him. And upon the seats, multiple thrones, if you will, actually I saw four and twenty elders, senior leaders sitting. Who are these spiritually mature governing leaders? Obviously, they're not angels because we see the angels in Revelation 5, 8 through 11, also around the throne. These elders then are mentioned here to symbolize outstanding individuals. Some believe them to be representatives of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. There's a problem here. Uh, the problem is the fact that we have more than 12 apostles mentioned in the New Testament. Matthias, of course, took Judas' place. He's mentioned in Acts 126. Barnabas is also listed as an apostle in Acts 14, 14. Paul is recorded as an apostle to the Gentiles in Acts 11, 13. And there's strong evidence that Timothy and Silas were also counted as apostles. If you read 1 Timothy 2, 6, and then compare it with 1 Thessalonians 1, 1, and when we consider these verses together, the ones who Paul had with him in this church planting effort that are noted as apostles were Timothy and Silas. No matter how creative we get in our numbering, there's still more than 12. So who do these thrones of elders pictured around Christ's throne? I believe we have a scriptural example of that. And for those of you that are taking notes, I would encourage you to turn to 1 Chronicles in your own studies in chapter number 24 and read verses 3 through 5 and then verse number 18. Because there you will see 24 different course, courses of priests mentioned. And in Luke, the first chapter, verses 3 through 5, we see Zechariah is listed as a priest from the course of Abia in the priesthood. And again, in Revelation 1, 6, we see the phrase kings and priests. And really, the term in the Greek language is kingdom of priests. We're not kings, but we're a kingdom of priests, John declares. And he also says this in Revelation 5, in verses 9 and 10, where we see the same phrase used again. And in Daniel 7, 9, I know I'm throwing a lot of scripture at you. Uh, write them down, study them out on your own. But Daniel saw thrones cast down. And that's... A difficult passage to wrap your mind around because these thrones were not actually cast down. These words actually picture seats being set around or placed next to the throne of the Ancient of Days, who is Jesus Christ. Since David as king divided up the priesthood in 24 different courses, sections, or subdivisions of priests to minister at different scheduled times in the tabernacle and later the temple. I believe these are those who picture us in Christ Jesus within his churches today comprising this kingdom priesthood 
that John sees here. Now, I mentioned this before, but there is a catchy phrase that really grabs a hold of religious people's attention. And it's uh, uh, the priesthood of all believers. When you begin studying the priests and their ministries, you will find their ministries are set in the tabernacle and in the temple. And all believers don't really minister and serve Christ. Because I can show you a host of individuals in the Old Testament who were priests and they died because they weren't serving God appropriately. So the priesthood of all believers just doesn't ring true. So if the priest served in the tabernacle and the priest served in the temple, and both the tabernacle and the temple picture the Lord's churches today, where is this priesthood? These 24 different courses of the priesthood ministering that are sitting upon thrones around the king. I'll let you make that decision on your own. John now sees these individuals clothed in white raiment. These robes speak of purity and the righteousness of their king. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. These garlands of gold were actually victors' crowns awarded the overcomers and the overcoming promises that we find in chapters 2 and 3 given to the Lord's churches. And again I say in a world filled with losers in Christ, we are the winners. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us, Paul declares in Romans 8, 37. And now in verse number 5, John says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Flashes of lightning picture God's light emanating from the throne. John defines God as light in the book of 1 John. This is who he is in essence. He's the light of the world. Amen. The thundering speak of God's awesome power. I remember coming home with my son on a preaching engagement and there was a huge storm uh, that came in and under every mortar way overpass cars were packed in there parked on the side of the road because the lightning and the thunder was happening instantaneously and light travels 185,000 miles per second per se and uh, thunder travels 6,000 miles per second so when you see lightning and thunder right behind it got you didn't I Brian <laughs> <laughs> you know this lightning is striking right near you and all we could do was travel about five miles per hour because the rain was so heavy it was going sideways and every bridge abutment I was looking for a little place to slide over and we couldn't find any and that lightning and thunderstorm continued for miles. And when the lightning hit, it was like it was daylight all around us. And the thunderclap was right behind it. So that lightning was coming right down on us. I can tell you I went to praying. 
because I didn't want to be sitting out along the roadside uh, with no uh, uh, overpass or something protecting you over you. So we just kept traveling on, and by God's grace, we got there. They had, on, they had on their heads crowns of gold. Later on in the verse, they threw those crowns before the throne of the king. And if we're granted by the grace of God to have crowns, and there's five of them in the New Testament, I can tell you what we'll be doing with them. We'll be throwing them at the feet of the master. Praise God. The voices John hears are those proclaiming praise to the king. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. And John tells us what this divine imagery is which are the seven spirits of God. The number seven in the Bible numerics is a scriptural number for completion. The sum of this number pictures the multiplicity of the Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives. The Holy Spirit then has many ministries that are multifaceted, involving leadership, assurance, teaching, witnessing, comforting, encouraging, and convicting and convincing us of our need for a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. In verse number six, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. The sea of glass pictures to us the radiant splendor surrounding the throne, being likened to crystal which speaks of transparency, clarity, and purity existing all around the throne of God. The mention of seas in prophetical areas of the Bible often pictured us the masses of humanity. And we're going to meet these same seas of souls once again when we get to Revelation 15. But here in verse number six, we're now introduced that in the midst of the throne and around the thrones were four beasts. I told you we were going to get deep. How deep do you want to go with Jesus? Because these are not beasts. These are angelic beings. Four living beings, not some animal-like monsters. These four living creatures are heavenly beings that John has great difficulty trying to describe them to us. This order of angelic beings are first seen in the garden where God sent an angel in Genesis 3.24 to guard the tree of life after Adam's fall. They resemble a special angelic company that are called cherubims in the scripture that the prophet Ezekiel describes to us in the following references. Ezekiel 1, in verses 5 through 28. Ezekiel 11, verse number 22. Ezekiel 41, verses 18 through 25. How deep do you want to go with Jesus? Here the prophet sees the angels sitting upon mobile judgment seats, resting upon a wheel within a wheel, allowing them to move and turn in any direction at a moment's notice to pronounce the sentence of God upon mankind. Each of these angelic beings 
had four faces. The face of man depicting Christ as the Son of Man. You see, God came to the earth. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. This is Jesus Christ, indeed. The face of the lion depicting Christ as the Lion of Judah reigning. The face of an ox representing Christ in his great omnipotence. The face of an eagle typifying Christ in the swiftness of his judgment. Their appearance was as burning coals of fire with lightning shooting forth out of the flames. And you see this in Ezekiel. They had four wings, where in Revelation, those around the Lord's throne had six. Cherubims come from a Hebrew term meaning great, glorious, and gracious. You see, these angels represent God in their ministries. Cherubims are mentioned some 64 times in the Old Testament. God is pictured in throne between these cherubims. And here are a few of these references. 1 Samuel, the fourth chapter, verse number four. 1 Chronicles, the 13th chapter, verse number six. 2 Kings, the 19th chapter, verse number 15. Psalms 99 and verse number one. Also, cherubims made from solid gold were fashioned to sit over the ark in the mercy seat in both the tabernacle and the temple, picturing to us where we must go to discover our Lord's mercy and his forgiveness. It's at the mercy seat where the king sits and reigns. Love it. These unique angels seen around Christ's throne also resemble another special order of angels that we see in the scriptures recorded for us by Isaiah the prophet. They're called seraphims. The Hebrew term for seraphim means fiery flames flashing brightly, picturing to us the brilliant light and the glory that is our Lord, for he alone is the light shining in a dark world filled with sin-darkened hearts that need Jesus. Wow. Amen. Here Isaiah is privileged to see these beings before their glorified king. These angels had six wings like those mentioned in Revelation. Their message is clear as they shout, Holy, Holy, Holy to the Lord of hosts. In Isaiah, the sixth chapter, in verses two through six, it is here in the Bible that we come to meet a holy God in an unholy world. It is here the scriptures in the scriptures that we come to see our need for Jesus and his love and life. Let's return once more to what John sees in Revelation in verse number six. Where our attention is drawn once more to this same crystal expanse surrounding the throne which reminds us of the awesome, the awesome crystal firmament that Ezekiel sees in Ezekiel 1, verse number 22. And we will meet this crystal-like sea of glass again in Revelation 15. I guess what I want to say in all of this, heaven is not some shadowy, misty place of clouds and foggy hazes. Heaven is a place of dazzling, brilliant radiance. Heaven is a place that you don't want to miss. Heaven is a place that Jesus offers us freely. Heaven is a place 
where all the prisms of color of refracting light emanating from the glory that is our God's. The sheen and glow of such light bouncing off and shimmering through these through this crystal vastness in a prism of colors of jewels and precious stones is something we can only try to imagine and envisage. How great is heaven? How glorious is our king? And it is here we are introduced to this special order of angelic beings. They differ from that of Ezekiel's vision in the fact that these angels only have one face, not four, but they have the same faces. And around the throne were four living angelic beings full of eyes before and behind. The angels, like their creator, see everything just as our Lord is omniscient. He sees all and knows everything that is happening in his creation. There's nothing that is out of his sight line nor out of his control. We have the misnomer to think that we have pretty much got life in control. But it only takes a moment, I mean, just a moment, and all of that changes. We realize that we've never been in control at all. When everything is spinning out of our control in our jobs and in our marriages and in our families and in our lives and in our hearts, rest assured, they're never out of his, where we remain secure in his loving arms. Praise God. Verse number seven. And the first beast, the first being, was like a lion, and the second angelic being like a calf or a young ox. The third angelic creation had the face like a man, and the fourth angelic creature was like a lofty eagle in flight. These four distinct faces seem to coincide and describe to us the message of the four different gospels betraying our Savior in a different light. The message of Matthew is a royal one, painting to us the gospel of the king, illustrated to us by the lion, seen in the many kingdom parables that we find there. In Mark's gospel, Mark portrays to us the servant's gospel, pictured as this young calf or ox. Luke's gospel reveals to us Christ as the Son of Man in all of his humanity, seen in the face of a man. And in John's Gospel, we see our Savior as the Son of God, magnifying his deity in the form of a soaring eagle flying. Being on deputation and preaching in the States is just a great privilege. I remember I was going between preaching engagements and I saw some eagles in flight. So I pulled, you know, they're soaring. So I just pulled the car over to the side of the road. I, I got to see this. And there were a whole bunch of turkey vultures and they were swooping in at all different angles uh, on these eagles. And the eagles didn't get upset at all. They didn't even try to fight them. These turkey vultures that come flying in at them, and the eagle would just turn its wing up, and the turkey vulture would go right through it, and vice versa. And they kept doing this. And they kept soaring higher and higher until the turkey vultures couldn't go any higher. 
and the eagles just soared. What a picture. What a beautiful picture of our Lord. Still with me in all this magnificent imagery of our Savior? Can I hold your attention just a little while longer? If so, read with me verse number 8. And the four beings had each of them six wings. Now back in Isaiah, the prophet told us that the seraphims used their wings in couplets of two. With two of them, they flew, serving and ministering. With two of them, they covered their feet, not being worthy to stand before the king. And with the last two of them, they covered their faces, not deserving to be looking into the face of such holiness. Try to grasp with me, holy angels, created holy, not being able to look upon the holiness of the one who created them. And they have a message. Holy, 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 being their awesome declaration of their creator God. We're right in the midst of heaven's throne and the worship that's being that is uh, taking place there. And I often think this, and, and, and I'm not trying to lay any guilt trips on you whatsoever, but I think we look at worship, uh, we have this blase sort of approach to worship. We just come, we don't spend much preparation in prayer. We're not praying for the man of God that is preaching the word. We're not prepared. And we just expect him to just hold us spellbound. Well, I will never do that. <laughs> But you know, when we enter into the presence of God, we enter into his holiness. And I think if we were aware of that, we'd come to worship in a completely different mind frame. Holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. And John tells us that these angelic beings were full of eyes within. They rest not day or night, saying and proclaiming one message, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The one who is, or the one who was, that's the pre-incarnate Christ. The one who is, God bless your heart, our Savior is alive. And the one who is to come, praise the Lord, our King is coming. And in verse number nine, and when these beings, these angelic creations of their creator, this is what they do. They give glory and honor and thanks to him. What do we do when we come to worship? They give glory, honor, and thanks to him that sat on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, praise God. And this is what we are giving our wondrous Lord today in worship. We give him the glory. We give him the honor.
We give our thanks to him. And I've said this before, I, I think um, not only is our approach to worship a bit apathetic at times, so is our prayer life. It normally consists of, give me God. But you see, God already knows what you have in need of before you even ask it. That's what the scriptures say. Sweet people, I spend most of my time praising and thanking God before I ever ask him for one thing. Well, we're to give him glory and honor and our thanks to him who sat on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, praise God. And by his grace, this is what we're giving him now. He is the one who lives forever and ever. Again, we don't worship some dead martyr, some dead saint some dead religious figure. We worship our creator, our creator God. We worship the king, the king of all kings, the king of glory, the prince of the kings are the titles he wears. We worship the Christ. We worship Jesus. We worship the great I am. And this is why we see in verse number 10, these four and 20 elders representing the royal priesthood that Peter describes, falling down before him that sat upon the throne, worshiping the one who liveth forever and ever, casting their crowns before the throne. In verse number 11, and we'll close, this is where we began. Thou art worthy, O Lord. God knows he's worthy. Of the glory, the honor, the power. Because he has created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. And you know, we're part of that creation. But I think it's interesting that God's creation doesn't have any difficulty giving Christ the praise. It's only you and I that have difficulty in this area. You see, sometimes our minds are not where they should be. Our hearts are not where they should be. Our lives are not where they should be. And because of that, we have other priorities and they get in the way and pretty soon God is just a hinder thought in our busy lives. And then on Sunday, we kind of try to jam Christ into one worship service and pretend that we're doing just fine when we're really not. That an almighty, all sovereign, all holy, all loving creator would love me and draw pleasure from me is beyond me most of the time. But I love it, he does. He takes pleasure in you. He takes pleasure in your heart. He takes pleasure in your life. And in return, 
he gives us his pleasure. How, how blessed are we, sweet people. I love this because Christ takes pleasure in me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for rescuing me from myself. Such is the privilege of our worship to you this day, Jesus. Amen. And next week, if you got the heart for it, we're going to look at the seven seals. Amen. God bless you.